Welcome everyone, this is another Chris Course with your host Chris, and in this episode we're going to be covering skill number two of how to become a canvas pro, drawing on the canvas. All right, so looking back at the last episode, we covered skill number one of how to become a canvas pro, creating and resizing your canvas. We also covered the most rudimentary shape we could draw with the canvas, the rectangle. Now the end goal here is still to create amazing visuals, but there's only so much we can create with just rectangles and squares. To get the most out of our visuals, we need to understand the full extent as to what objects we can draw and how to draw them. To name some, with the canvas we can draw rectangles, lines, arcs which we can use to also create circles, bezier curves, images, and text. So for the sake of time, we're not going to be covering how to draw all of these within this course, but we will be covering those which are most widely used, which are the first three, rectangles, lines, and arcs. Once we have a solid foundation in regards to how to draw these three shapes, we'll be moving into some programming 101, where I'll show you how to officially create hundreds of these shapes at once using only a couple lines of code. So without further ado, let's get to work and cover skill number two, drawing on the canvas. Alright, welcome back everyone. So this is where we left off in the last episode. As you can see here, we drew a few rectangles on the screen and we also resized our canvas to fit the entire width and height of the browser. So as I mentioned, there are quite a few different objects that we can draw on the canvas, but we are only going to be focusing on the lines and arcs, which we can use to draw circles, mainly for time's sake. So I would love to show you guys everything, but unfortunately, to keep these videos short, we can only focus on a few things at once. But nevertheless, the lines and the arcs and circles are some of the most widely used pieces that we can draw on the canvas. And if you'd like to learn how to draw any of the other objects I listed in the intro, then I do have links in the description of this video in which you can use to see the syntax on how you can go about drawing those. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started with drawing a line. So let's go ahead and comment a section out so we can specify this is where we're going to be drawing our lines. And in order to get started with drawing a line, we're first going to need to grab our magic C variable. And we are going to begin a path. And this is basically an indicator for Canvas saying, okay, we want to start a path. Do not connect this path to anything preceding it. So we declare to Canvas we want to begin a path, but now we need to actually declare where on the Canvas we want our path to start. So we are going to say C dot move to and move to takes an x and a y coordinate for its arguments so we're going to start off our line somewhere over here so that means our x coordinate would be around 50 pixels and our y coordinate would be around i think this is around 300 pixels so our point is basically over here and if we refresh the page you're not going to see anything because this point is invisible until we call a stroke method. As soon as we call the stroke method, then you'll start to see a line from a point to point. So now that we have our starting point, we can go ahead and create a line to a new point. So to create a line to a new point, we're going to say C dot line to. And then this is going to be an X and a Y coordinate, which specifies where we want our line to go to. So if we want it to go somewhere up here, then our coordinate would be something around 300 pixels for our X value. And our Y would be around, that's about 100 pixels, I would say. So we're basically drawing a line from here all the way to up here, a diagonal line. Now, if I refresh the page again, you're not going to see anything as of yet, because as I mentioned, we need to call a stroke method for this line to show. So to call the stroke method, we're going to say C, that stroke, save that, and now when we refresh the page, you're going to see, okay, I was a little off on the coordinates, but we now have a line extending from one point to another. And we can continue drawing on this line by adding more c.line2s. So let's say something like 400, 300. And now you see we're extending our line to another point. And we can keep doing this as many times as we'd like, but for now, let's just go ahead and keep things as is. Now, something else I'd like to cover is how to add colors to Canvas, colors to our lines and colors to the inner fills of our shapes. So to add colors to our lines, it's actually quite simple. Before our stroke method, we need to add a property called C.strokeStyle. And stroke style is going to be equal to any CSS color. So it can be an RGBA value like so, or it can be 
a text color value like blue, or it can be a hexadecimal value. And it'll work with any one of these. So if I put in a random hexadecimal value here, and let's add a semicolon at the end of that just to be safe, you can see we have a lovely pink line being created instead of a black one as we had previously. So this is how we change the color for our lines using a stroke style property. But how do we change the colors for our filled rectangles? Well, to change the color for our filled rectangles, we need to add a fill style property rather than a stroke style property. So we're going to say C, not fill style. And this is going to be equal to a CSS color value as well. So it can be RGBA. Let's go ahead and do RGBA for this one. And let's make this red. We're going to say 255, 0, 0. And then we're going to add an alpha value of just 0.1. And if we refresh the page, you can now see we have a very, very light red rectangle instead of that harsh black rectangle as we saw earlier. And if we want to change this, let's go ahead and bump this up a little bit so we can see it better. All right, so now we have three rectangles that are semi-transparent. But what if we want to change just one of these rectangles so only one of our rectangles is semi-transparent? Well, we can change the colors for all of these rectangles by preceding them with different fill styles. The fill rect is going to take whatever fill style is before it, and then it's going to fill itself in with that color that is specified. So let's go ahead and change this to blue. We're going to say zero. And it would be green. We're going to say 255 for our blue value. So now you can see we have a red and we have two blue rectangles. So let's go ahead and change this last one to green. All right, so now you can see we have a different color line, different color rectangles, and I encourage you to play around with this a bit. Go ahead and create some rectangles. Go ahead and create some lines with different colors and kind of really get a feel for things because that's where you're going to learn the most is when you're actually playing around on your own, trying to figure out, okay, how do I do this? What's the problem? How do I solve it on my own? That's when the knowledge is really going to be retained. So I really highly encourage you to play around with this for a little bit before we move on to the arc section. So let's go ahead and learn how to create an arc with Canvas. We're going to be using arcs to create circles because once we create an arc that is 360 degrees around, that's where we get our circle. So to create an arc or a circle, we are going to say c.arc. An arc takes quite a few arguments. So it takes an x value and it takes a y value. So let's go ahead and place it uh, somewhere over here. Let's just go ahead and say 300, 300. And it takes a radius, so let's give it a radius of 30 for now. And it takes something called a start angle and an end angle. Now, the start and end angle properties don't take degrees, they take radians. Essentially, the start angle property says at what angle would we like to start drawing our arc, while the end angle property says how long would we like the arc to go on for. If you're unfamiliar with radians, I recommend pausing the video and checking out the Khan Academy link in the video's description. Salman Khan does a terrific job in making this topic, which may seem complex at first, very simple to understand. All right, so now that we know a little bit about radians, we have our start angle, which declares where do we want our arc to start. So we want our arc to start at an angle of zero, and we want our arc to end at a radian of math.pi times two, because that'll give us the full arc. That'll give us an angle that extends all the way from the beginning to the very end of our circle. So draw counterclockwise, that just specifies which direction should the arc actually be drawn in. This, for our purpose, it's not a huge deal which one we choose, so we're just going to say false for now. It's not going to be drawn counterclockwise. And now that we have this, we actually have created an outline for an arc, just an outline. So if you refresh the page, you're not going to see anything, because like I said, we just have an outline for it, but we need to fill that outline in using a stroke or a fill property. So we are going to say c.stroke. And with that in place, we now have a full circle being drawn. But you'll also notice we just created a line from our last path, our last line two, that is connecting to our circle. And we don't want that. And that's where this begin path method comes in. We want to make sure that we're proceeding any arc or any line with this begin path method because it's going to separate the two and prevent them from connecting to each other. So if we refresh the page with begin path there, you can see now our circle is separated from our line and we are good to go. So now that we know how to give our strokes and arcs colors. Let's go ahead and give our arc a different stroke style. And let's just go ahead and use a text color for this one, which we're going to say blue. All right, so these are the bare basics. We know how to draw rectangles, we know how to draw lines, connect the lines, and we know how to draw a circle and arcs, basically. And we also know how to change their stroke colors and their fill colors. 
And this may not look great at the moment. I agree with you. This does not look great at all. But as I mentioned, these are the main building blocks we'll need to create any amazing canvas piece. Once we start using colors and start animating these guys and creating multiple shapes, that's when the pieces will really start to come together. And that's when we'll really start having fun and creating really eye appealing visuals. So let's not leave off on this. Let's go ahead and ask ourselves a question. What if we wanted to create hundreds of circles? How would we go about doing that? Well, I guess if we look at our code, what we could do is we can copy and paste our circle code a hundred times, but you can see that's going to get out of hand really quickly. We would have to change the coordinates for each of these over and over again, and that is just a maintenance nightmare. You do not want to do that if you're creating multiple circles. So let me go ahead and show you how to create multiple circles using a for loop. So if you're new to for loops, let me do my best to explain it for you. So a for loop is just going to call whatever is inside of it however many times you specify. And you specify how many times you want this for loop to run by inserting some code within these parentheses here. So to specify how many times we want this for loop to run, we are first going to declare a variable. We're going to say i is equal to 0. Then we're going to say run this for loop as long as i is less than three. So this means we're going to be running this for loop three times. So we're starting off on zero and we're going to run this for loop until i is equal to three. Well, how do we increment i? To increment i, we're going to be adding i plus plus as our third argument within this for loop. So this is what's going to happen, is we have an i variable. We're going to run through this for loop at least once. Once we hit the end, we're going to add one onto i. That's all this means. We're adding one onto the current value of i. So that means i would be equal to one. So then we're going to run through it again, add one onto the value of i. So that means we're going to have two and we're just going to loop back to the top and run it all the way until i equals three. Because once i equals three, that means this conditional is false. And therefore this loop is not going to run anymore. So let's go ahead and comment our code out for the circle right now. And with this in place, this means that the code within this for loop is going to run exactly three times. And if you refresh the page, you can actually see, you, you might have actually noticed that this circle is a little bolder than it was before. That's because we're drawing three circles on top of each other. Now this isn't really effective. We want to make sure that our circles are being drawn in either random locations on the screen or maybe coordinated locations on the screen, but definitely not on top of each other because it doesn't really make sense to draw three circles on top of each other just to change the line width because we can do that manually using a line width property. But let's go ahead and change the location of these three different circles. To change the location, we need to make sure that we're changing these x and y values so that they're different from each other. Right now they're the same, so therefore they're being drawn on top of each other. We want to make sure that these are different each time we run through the for loop. So a really easy way to do this is adding some variables, one for our x coordinate and one for our y coordinate. And we are going to set these variables equal to math.random. So if you're unfamiliar with it, this math.random function returns a value anywhere from 0 to 1. Any random value from 0 to 1, it can be 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.65, it'll store that value with an x and y, and that means each time we run through this for loop, we're going to be returned a different random value. So like I said, this is only 0 through 1, so if we were to enter our x and y values within our arc now, since 0 and 1 are all the way up here, our circles should be all moved to this top left corner. And if we refresh the page, you'll see, yeah, exactly that happened. Now, we want to make sure that these circles are randomized throughout the full width and height of our screen. So in order to do that, we are going to multiply math random by the windows, inner width for our x value, and then for y, we are going to multiply it by our windows, inner height. And basically what we're doing here is we're saying return a random value anywhere from zero to the full inner width of our screen. And then we're also saying for our Y value, give us a value anywhere from zero to the full inner height of our screen. So if we save that, refresh the page, you can now see that our circles are randomized each time we refresh it. And this is pretty cool. This is starting to get a little more interesting than it was before because previously we just had static shapes, but now we're actually having some things move around randomly. We're starting to procedurally generate things, which is actually pretty fun to play around with. So you're not limited to just three. You can actually change the value. Like I said, a for loop will call whatever is inside of it as many times as you specify. So let's say we want to call this 100 times. Now we have 100 circles. If we want more than that, then we can go ahead and change this 400. And we can even go as high as 
maybe 2400 and it starts filling up the entire screen. Now, if I go any higher, then your computer will probably start to lag because it's drawing so many circles and it can't actually handle that computationally. So I actually encourage you to play around with this as well. It's really fun. Uh, start changing the X and Y values. See what kind of stuff you can come up with. Start bringing lines in here. Randomize the values of these lines. Randomize the values of your rectangles. And this is exactly what you need to do to start creating good-looking, procedurally generated animations. So as a challenge to you, before we start heading on over to the animation section, I challenge you to randomize the colors of each of these strokes. So one stroke should be blue, one should be red, one should be yellow, any color from the color wheel. Go ahead and randomize this so that it's calling any color from that. It'll provide a good challenge to get you familiar with the for loop over here and also familiar with the idea of randomizing values. So we now know how to draw the three most basic objects we can onto the canvas. We know how to draw rectangles, we know how to draw lines, and we also know how to draw arcs slash circles. So the next one is where the magic really starts happening. We created some magic here by randomizing and creating multiple circles at once, but once we add animation onto the mix, that's where things really start getting cool. We're going to start adding conditionals for our circles to bounce off walls. And then in the fourth episode, we're going to add event listeners so that when we hover over our circles, they actually grow in size. So that's it for this one, folks. Get a feel for the random number generators over here, the four loops, because we're going to be using this over and over again within our future canvas pieces. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed, and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Later.